known as paradise on Earth, Hangzhou in East China boasts beautiful natural scenery, rich history, and a fast-growing economy. Is now the host city of the 19th Asian Games. 40 sports, 481 events, 56 venues, 16 days. The Asian Games have come to China for the third time. Join us for our special coverage of the largest sports meet of a dynamic Asia, September 23rd to October the 8th on CGTN. Hello and welcome to this edition of Biz Talk. I'm Chen Jufeng in Beijing. The 19th Asian Games in China's eastern city of Hangzhou has grabbed attention from all around the world as the biggest sporting event after 2008 Beijing Olympic Games in China. The Hangzhou Games has showcased a future sports industry featured with digital economy, digital technology, sustainability and intelligence. Today, we will look beyond the arena and scoreboard and delve into the sports industry in China. Join us in the studio. We have uh, Ms. Liu Hong, Associate Professor from the School of Sports Economics and Management of Central University of Finance and Ec Economics. Uh, thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. And uh, Paul Dong, co-founder of EI Asia. Uh, 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 Mr. Dong has been visiting us uh, for quite a lot of time. Good yeah. to be back here. Yeah. Welcome back. Join us via a Zoom online. We have Mark Thomas, Managing Director of S2M Consulting, and Remigio Brunetti, Managing Director of Technica Group China. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Great. Thanks uh, for hosting us. Great. The Asian Games of Hangzhou will feature 12,000. Actually, these uh, 12,000 athletes from 45 nations are already competing. We can see from a TV, from uh, all these uh, streaming online, uh, very good games, very beautiful arenas. Also, they're competing for 481 gold medals. First question to all of you, I mean, very briefly, why this game is significant? Starting from you, Mr. Dong. The, the question? I'm yeah, sorry. why this game is important? Well, the Asian Games, the largest games, uh, multi-sport event in this, on this continent, which is demographically the largest in the world, and also the size of the games, is uh, besides the Olympics, it's the largest among all continental multi-sport events. Of course, it's the biggest. It involves so many athletes, participants, and also to be being watched by so many people on this continent and even some other people outside of the continent who would be paying attention to you know to the potential of several sports uh that can they can expect after the asian games like uh, rugby like cricket you know uh, like e e-games and e-sports because they all have a lot of expectations in this milestone asian games to plan for their commercial future here. Great, yeah, good to know. We'll talk about uh, more details on that, those new uh, games added into uh, this year's events. Sure. What about you, Miss Lee? What, what do you think of the significance of this game? Uh, for me, I prefer from to a little bit introduce about the economic impact and uh, on Hangzhou. You know the you know the, every city they try to update the host host sport events for different reasons like yeah. the international focus mm -hmm. or the or the they can get some image raised. But for me, I think the profit uh, uh, profit it is the financial profit it is um, supposed on the top of the list. You know. If we can explain from the economic impact from this from this aspect, we can say you know KPMG is one of the big uh, big uh, for account accounting organizer. Yeah. They has uh, conduct the economic impact on Hong Kong in the 2017. From according to their analysis, you know the total economic of sport you want are calculated by the aggregating for the for this the, for the directly 
uh, impact, indirect impact, and the induced impact. All this derived from the expenditure of the, these three holders. And the one of uh, the three holder is the spectator and the participant and the organizer. You know, you just mentioned that almost 12,000, that means they participate. For here, we to clarify that participate means the isolate from the foreigner, okay. including their dedicating. Yeah. In the, such like uh, coaches, managers, also including there. Sometimes they have relatives and family of the athletes. Okay. In general, the more participate involved, the more significant for the for this country and the more economic impact. Okay. So this number is very large. It's unexpected and the even larger, more than one thousand than Tokyo twenty twenty Olympic Games. Okay. So again the more international participants involves marks higher international significance and the higher economic impact. Okay, mm. great. Uh, Mr. You've been, uh, Mr. Ramiggio, because uh, you've been known in the industry as Mr. Uh, what do you think of the significance of the game? You've been in the industry for many years and you yourself has been an athlete for many years. Um, you were also running a sports company for many years. <laughs> Well, Mizu is fine, and don't worry, even in the next uh, <laughs> question poses, it's fine. But as I, the <clears throat> other two guests, they, they said, I would like just to emphasize that it's uh, probably the most important event uh, in the clean uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is very important. <clears throat> and uh, I think that all the stakeholders, they are waiting this kind of momentum. And uh, I would like to, for me, a little bit out of uh, the sports himself, but as a evidence how important are these games, uh, I mean, even uh, the president Xi Jinping uh, uh, declares the opening of the Asian Games, so mm -hmm. it's very important. It means that from the top government down to the to the athletes, uh, there is a big involvement and a big expectation to deliver an outstanding sporting uh, event. Uh, that, that it's not only for China, but it's uh, and probably it's not only for Asia. It's for everyone uh, because uh, all the sports industry need a uh, clean uh, and. Uh, yeah games uh, with uh, open participation from uh, from the fans and the audience. And uh, in addition, uh, even uh, dignitaries that, that from around the world are attending at the opening ceremony, for example, including the South Korea prime minister. So there are even geopolitical uh, messages behind uh, these games. And I, they're thinking that there is a big expectation from, uh, from everyone. Yeah, thank you for making notes of those uh, features. And Mark, what about you? You've been in the industry for many years too. You, you earlier told me you've been in the industry for 20 years and a frequent traveler between China and the West. Uh, why this game would make any difference in China's sports industry? Almost 30 years actually, so I'm a bit of an old hack. So for me, I, I think uh, one of the most important things is sort of putting uh, China back on the sporting map. There's been a, a hiatus in terms of international sports events in China for the last years because of the pandemic. So it's important that I think China reestablish itself as a venue for major sports events and then reaps all the benefits that can give. So an event like the Hangzhou Asian Games gives a holistic opportunity to exploit from uh, increasing visibility and promotion of the city and the country to developing infrastructure and facilities to stimulating uh, youth sports and grassroots participation right through to the boost in uh, tourism and other economic impact that uh, I'm sure we'll cover later. But for me, uh, you know, with a bit of a passion and interest, I'm really uh, very keen to see this as a test case, to see how a holistic approach is taken to embed technology right through the uh, ecosystem of the event. And I think that's really going to be an exciting thing because I believe the Hanjo Games uh, will be at the cutting edge at under the forefront of that, that not only other folks in China can follow, but also globally it will be an important uh, event to, to lay the foundation on the tech side. Okay, you talk about technology. Uh, it's uh, also very impressive for us to see in the opening ceremony to see that giant digital figure coming up to, to digitally light up the torch. Uh, it's quite impressive. Uh, what other features do you think are important? Because in the industry, sports industry, finally it has to be man-to-man, people-to-people exchanges, you know, helping athletes or helping amateurs, um, coaching them. It's, it's not digital, it's, it's you know, 
<laughs> down to ground, it's people-to-people uh, -people exchanges. When these people in the industry see the, uh, the, the, the grand opening ceremony of Asian Games and see these uh, matches between thousands of athletes, do you think they can see a big uh, sports industry opportunity lying ahead for them in China, Mark? To, to be honest, I mean, going back to the technology side, it's invasive through everything that we now do in sports, from the, uh, the smart venues, from athlete tracking, performance analysis, you know, right through to some of the technologies we use in terms of that opening cer ceremony on virtual and augmented reality. Uh, and data, you know, is, r is running the way we think, manage, engage with, uh, with all manner of our audience. So I think that provides a, a real opportunity to then say, well, how can that be used sort of to take the business of sport uh, forward? I mean, traditionally, we've seen sport sort of being driven by certain uh, economic factors and sort of monetization opportunities such as media rights, uh, uh, hosting rights, sponsorship, ticketing, et cetera, which is more the commercial, the traditional commercial model. I think this offers an opportunity to branch out in what I would say is a far more digitally focused uh, model, whereby things like e-commerce, social commerce are put at the forefront. And I honestly believe this is a, a space that uh, not only the games, but China as a whole, holds a little bit of a lead on the rest of the world. So I think that can really act as a forefront to that development and offer a whole new monetized op opportunity for the sports industry. Okay. And to you, Amiso, because you're in the sports gear industry, and uh, does this uh, um, fandom, does this enthusiasm in these grand games directly translate to business opportunities or sales opportunities for your company? Uh, <laughs> You know, the Asian Games in this particular moment are uh, focused on, on the summer. Of course, uh, I think that there is no direct benefit for us, but uh, I think that it's the big benefit is for all the sport communities and, uh, and the sport fans. Uh, because uh, as, we, as we know, over the last four years, we didn't have any kind of uh, regular season, no matter if it's summer or, uh, or winter. There would be a lot of uh, events that being cancelled, postponed, uh, uh, I was talking with Mark before that, I mean, uh, the uh, Rolex uh, tennis uh, <clears throat> events in Shanghai is going to grab a lot of people because uh, I think that the fans, uh, they want to get in closer to their own uh, idol, uh, going to smiling, as you said, it's people to people in the end, you know, because the artificial intelligence is helping us uh, to develop in a lot of uh, other information and developing business. But in the end, uh, the patient to be inside of the venue, to be closest to, to our athletes and our idols is the, is the most important. Before, as a second and benefit, I think in that all uh, these kind of big events is going to be regenerated a certain passion, a certain positive approach uh, from all the players uh, and fan sports in order to not just play sports uh, to be an athlete or to be a professional sport player, but to enjoy the social sport, uh, the capacity of the sport to aggregate to people, no matter which is the uh, specific uh, sport industry that we are talking about. Mm, but you, you mentioned uh, uh, it didn't translate directly to your business, but Mr. Technica uh, makes shoes, right? I, I have Technica shoes, uh, hiking shoes. I mean, <laughs> it, it's related, See, isn't it? It's, uh, it's well, you're right in some, I mean, it's, uh, here t we are talking about mainly uh, athletic sports inside of the ring. I mean, we do technica as a trade running. So, so far, unfortunately, trade running is not as a, as a sport, uh, is uh, able to grab in a lot of attention worldwide. There was a lot of Chinese uh, fans uh, in uh, UTMB and uh, Tour de Jeanne uh, over the last two weeks in Europe uh, to participate at the biggest events. Uh, specifically for the Asian Games, I would like to say that we have uh, inline skates rollerblades. So, I mean, for sure, it's going to be the, the an, important, an important part. But for me, it's more. Uh, Generally, I mean, how we are able to grab in the attention to uh, to, uh, to the public uh, with important events uh, and in the next uh, two, three months. Uh, and I think that this uh, is a kickoff of uh, an important season because we reopen uh, the uh, tennis. Uh, and then we're talking about Formula One in March, April, if I remember well, in Shanghai as well. So, I mean, it's uh, there is uh, a continuity of sports events uh, to keep it uh, feeding the market and feeding the 
defense uh, with uh, attractive events uh, where the Chinese people, they can go face to face, people to people to match in the, the uh, attending, sorry, at the events uh, and uh, have the chance to touch in uh, the, their own uh, their own idol because I think that this one is the most important part that we're missing over the last four years. Yeah. Good for you to mention that. Um, Mr. Dong, Mr. Dong just mentioned that, that he'd like the market, the Chinese market, to continuously see big events, domestic, international events, sports events, continuing in line, you know, every month in the country to attract attention, to arouse uh, people with enthusiasm for sports. Um, the city of Chengdu just hosted the university yet, university games now. Uh, Hangzhou, the Asian Games, uh, Miso mentioned the Formula One in Shanghai. I don't know other events, probably in the winter, there will be winter game, uh, different kinds of winter games are lining up together in pipeline. Do you think these public attentions can translate into sports activities for the public and boost the overall sports industry, create commercial opportunities? I think generally speaking, when you have so many events going on here, underway in China, you do have that kind of confidence, although it's still, it's still some way before reaching that target that you still need a lot of efforts to navigate from, you know, what you experience when witnessing something happening on that level, like, like the Asian so Games. So the direct answer um, be is no. Before you reach is the it? grassroots level, and there is a lot of work, you cannot let There's up. There's a long line, huh? Absolutely. Uh, you know, there, there will be something like, you know, when you are really exhausted after hosting the game, putting together the games, and you kind of let up, you kind of take a rest. And then it's sometimes it's, it's very slow for you to come back to your top form to do something you were supposed to do that when you plan to bid for the games and you told yourself, you know, after the games, I would have tremendous potential to tap the potential for on the grassroots level to you know uh, motivate the population to do something similar, or as an you know kind of after effect of the Asian Games, but but then you feel tired, and you forget about your your original plan, and so I think there should be a mechanism reminding you that you're only halfway through to reaching your ultimate goal. What do you mean by you? The organizer or the yeah the, the host public? people the host the city nation okay. and everybody I, I think they will be very very exhausted but I can tell you what while the Asian games are going on and you ignore about you know any other Asian countries or even uh, far northwest of China just look at Zhejiang province there are several tournaments outside of the Asian games international tournaments going on and you kind of ignore them, but they are international level events. A tennis well, tournament yeah, now in yeah, Ningbo, yeah. the women's the China Open in the, Beijing. The, yeah. In Beijing, that's yeah. next week. But you know, and and then in Ningbo, the women's volleyball Olympic Paris Olympic qualifiers yeah. attracted so much attention, distracting any attention from the Asian Games. I mean, there are a lot of events going on because of What's the post-COVID opportunities. Okay, and there are four international ATP and WTA tennis tournaments now going on so in China. So you're saying that we do not lack of these international competitions? I mean, I mean, the organizers tend to be exhausted after this weekend. And what would that mean if they can still motivate it, energetic as they wish they would be, so that they can keep the momentum, keep doing the right things to, you know, to not let the public forget about it after quite a long time. And then they realize, oh, it's in my memory. I had some very good moments during the Asian Games, but what should I do now? Because Start playing your own games, yeah, people, probably. Because people in this business or in this industry yeah. uh, didn't catch up with your target audience or population in the right time. And that's a challenge. Wow. I think that's what we call legacy, isn't it? Legacy planning with an event. And I think uh, uh, an event like the Hangzhou Games has a strong legacy plan. Uh, you know, I was in an evolve with uh, the London Olympics and also the Beijing Olympics. And to a greater or lesser degree, that legacy planning is all about what happens afterwards. Uh, and I think that's an important part of the strategic positioning for any major uh, international event, whether it be a, 
a smaller provincial event, as you mentioned just then, or a major, you know, pan-Asian or global event such as the uh, Asian Games. Yeah? Uh, yeah, absolutely agreed. And also, now that you are so familiar with the situation in China, the particular challenge here in China is when you put together the Asian Games or the Olympic Games, is primarily or even overwhelmingly driven by the government. But when it comes to the sports industry or business development, it's then up to the society. It's and up then, to the investors. Yeah, there is a natural gap between the two sides. Yeah. You know, the organizers or those governmental driven parties after the games, very challenging games, they tend to relax or they move on to something else. But then, all of a sudden, yes, it's up to grassroots level society to take over the responsibility. How would they you know, work together to make the transition as smooth as possible? That's but isn't the challenge. That, but shouldn't that be the, the, the most natural process? Shouldn't things be done like that? Absolutely not, because during the games, you kind of you know, operate the games based on the Olympics or Asian Games Bible, quote unquote Bible, yeah. that's the, the norm. And then when it comes to popularizing some sports yeah. among the general public, it's, it's up to the local grassroots level organizations, largely privately owned. Yeah. And they didn't really have a role to play during the Asian Games no. or the Olympics. And then nobody actually hand over the baton to them and make sure that it will not drop. What about the, the, the reason public Because when it comes to the public's events, involvement yeah. with the Asian Games, other than those 50,000 volunteers, largely millions of people would just Watch. be watching, yeah. uh, you know, uh, applauding. But then when Isn't you look at them and see if they can involve themselves, you know, personally in practicing those sports, it's something really, really different from during Are the Are you games. saying it's, it's weak influence, rather weak influence, no. just being an audience to those games? I, I think in, it takes a lot of efforts to bridge as many links between the two as possible. For example, the personalities who win medals can inspire certain group of people, sure. which was not really true, not realistic, over the last 30 or 40 years in China because most of the people were busy doing their own jobs, their own businesses, uh, trying to improve the country's manufacturing and other industries, trying to create better lives. But now the situation is different and people realize that they may not necessarily have so many roles to play back in the production lines, which are being taken over by you know AI or other technologies, and they realize they can they can do by themselves to play the real roles in sports or culture or other you know businesses, and then you need to encourage them that you know you can also be very similar or even better than that Those skateboarder who, who okay. won a middle a middle school student who just won the medal the gold medal in Hangzhou, and you can do the same thing. And it's very different from my generation who just watched the elites of the, China, of the country to win as many medals as possible over the last 30 years. So, Ms. Li, what Mr. Dong just said, I think generally, is that the <laughs> hosting mega games does not directly translate into rising public enthusiasm in participating in those uh, sports and games uh, by themselves. What do you think? But, uh, from our research, actually, this is a part of the influence from the major games. You know, even you just being watch the game, you know, the sometime you are inspired by some experience or for the, some athletes. Maybe you start to do exercise from now. And the, also, this kind of sport culture, you know, everybody talk about it. Like now, everybody talk about the Hangzhou Asia Games. Everywhere, every media cover everything. So this is also the in part of you, you are going to influence that. So I think uh, for me, uh, you I think it's positive. Yeah, this is positive. Okay. They will influence the people's way in a positive way. Okay, mm -hmm. and maybe children.
next generation. Yeah, yeah. children generation they influenced by the some some of the popular popular athletes by okay. everything. So. And what about you, Mark? Do you think it's positive influence directly? Positive influence. Uh, very firm yes between raising international sports games events to the rising of commercial opportunities yeah it's not a black and white answer I think uh, mr. Dong did touch on I think some of the issues relating to Chinese events especially in the past where focus was on the event and the impact it could give itself I think if you look at most modern models of games they in from the moment they, they conceive the uh, the event they start what's known as legacy strategy and legacy planning which fuses everything with the games with what it's going to mean for the future whether that be uh you know stimulating more sort of grassroots uh participation and how you know having uh, existing facilities left for the general public to use and practice and enjoy those things uh, through to basically you know brands who have never maybe sponsored events before getting involved in and activating that year. So I, I'm actually on site at the Chizong Center in Shanghai, the tennis center, where we will be hosting the uh, Rolex Shanghai Masters uh, starting next week. And I think this what is, is that? Great... Can you tell me again? What is that? Sorry? What is that event that you're going to raise? Well, it's Shanghai Masters, the ATP 1000 event in Shanghai. That's, oh, uh, tennis. So I, I'm on site here. And that, that event in one shape or form has been going on for 25 years. So over that time, it has stimulated a local economy in itself. Uh, if, if I go outside, I see uh, sponsors who are involved in all sorts of acti activation from setting up hospitality to entertain clients to doing public uh, uh, exhibitions to again stimulate and again lots of technology including sort of VR uh, and AR are being used there uh, but there's also you know companies that are then doing grassroots activations going out into the community and supporting the, uh, the development of participation of sports so that that I, I think comes in time with an event. So it, 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 it's sometimes not so black and white, but the sports economy is a complex and really important ecosystem to fit into a general economy. Um, and I think the potential in China has only just begun. I think we're still sitting uh, in China at somewhere just below 1% uh, as a contribution of the sports industry to China GDP. So if you look at the states, for example, uh, sport contributes somewhere between two and three percent. So you can imagine if we can stimulate that economy, whether it be at the elite level, uh, commercial sponsorship, participation, I think it's really important and that can develop the economy. One of the things I just sort of leave with here, the, the most important thing for developing a foundation for sports economy is to have people participating at as young an age as, as possible because when you participate you fall in love with the sport if you fall in love with the sport you become a fan if you're a fan you become a consumer if you're a consumer you buy tv subscription you buy merchandise you buy tickets and all of a sudden you have a, a an economy so quite often i think in the past there's been a focus on the elite and top of the sport whether the effort really needs if you want to stimulate a long sustainable economic uh, sports industry the development and passion needs to be developed from a young age so those youngsters then grow up to become genuine fans and consumers of sport points taken thank you uh, we'd like to talk a bit more on that uh, later on uh, but to you Miso, because uh, this is a um, very um, personal experience for me, uh, being a ski fan for many years and right after the 2022 Winter Olympic Games, I personally see a huge rise of enthusiasm around the Beijing area to participate in ski and snowboarding. Uh, what I heard from friends in the industry like, uh, like you and some other uh, gear brands, ski gear brands, uh, you've seen a rise of customers uh, which 
sometimes buy out your all your stockings, right? Yeah, but well, I mean, my consideration is uh, link it with the uh, previous panelists. They say that it's uh, why the winter sports are growing dramatically over the last, uh, I would like to say, twelve months. Uh, it's because uh, Sui Min won a gold medal and <laughs> Elingu they won a gold medal. Mm -hmm. So uh, that of relates course, to what Mr. Dong just said. Uh, those uh, inspiring a, figures, think, you know, super talents. It's a, yeah. I think uh, as a, like uh, the previous uh, panelists, they say it's not only black and white. Uh, there is not only one side that you go. I mean, there are a lot of dogs uh, that I need to put a line at in order to be successful for one specific industry, and. Uh, Specifically for winter today, China, it's uh, quite uh, an unusual market because 80% of the winter sports fans are on snowboard. Mm. Compared to the rest of the world, that we can take in about uh, 40, maximum 50%. Okay, And the mature mm. winter uh, sports countries like US or, no, or the Alps uh, countries is even less than 40. And the main reason is uh, because uh, it's a swimming. Uh, and uh, since uh, so, um, Pyongyang, uh, Winter uh, Olympic uh, Games, uh, they're starting to have quite consistent results. And uh, Ellingu is bringing some new fresh uh, for the ski industry because uh, it's a freestyle, slope style, but anyway, is on ski. So I think that uh, this is really important for each single sport, uh, specifically for the winter. I'd like to say that, as I said uh, before, we don't have a full season over the last four. No. And uh, all the stakeholders are, uh, are ready to welcome uh, the fans, uh, starting from the ski resort, uh, from the uh, ski school, uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from the brands. Uh, so all the stakeholders, because in the end, is, uh, even the tourism, uh, it's very important uh, because uh, sport is a destination in this particular case. Uh, and therefore, even the infrastructure need to be able to deliver an uh, outstanding uh, uh, service uh, to, to the fans. Uh, so this is the uh, the part. The, what I would like to add in compared to your consideration is that uh, what I'm surprised over the last uh, six months, uh, it's uh, the biggest uh, uh, interest that is coming from the south of uh, Shanghai. Mm. So Shanghai, Hangzhou, uh, Chongqing, uh, Chengdu, even Guangzhou, they develop an indoor ski dome where they can people they can ski 24 uh, 12 months a year yes. and they can keep critics and this is a very important for uh, for the old industry because there are uh, uh, activation at each single level and uh, the possibility for the fans to play and to speaking about the sports uh, all over the uh, all over the year so it's very interesting how the south part of china is going to be involved in the winter sports okay so you basically just... mentioned uh, the the growth potential of China's sports market is uh, uh, definitely influenced by two elements. One is the rising stardom of super talented athletes, um, and two is investment driven, the industry, like uh, you mentioned, the indoor ski, uh, super, you know, a complex. Because, yeah, providing because... um, the public, the location, the, the right places to practice. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, correct. And these are two elements, but not the only two. I mean, uh, we're talking about the FIS uh, to bring in again uh, some World Cup events. Uh, we need to improve in the uh, education of the either at the school, uh, but at, as well as uh, to prepare ski instructor or to prepare uh, winter sports uh, coaches. So as uh, again, it's been repeated over the last uh, 10 minutes, uh, all the elements, there is no one single element that is going to be turning uh, in a positive or negative, uh, the trend uh, in one uh, in the sports. All these kind of elements are important, and all the stakeholders need to work in all together. And these kind of uh, events, like you hosting host different um, experts uh, from different perspective, it's important to merge all the experience uh, and towards uh, the same uh, the same direction. Okay. Because otherwise, uh, not only the sports uh, organizer, because someone say they just watch it on the TV, and then you don't have any link uh, to keep going and to feed in uh, the uh, the market and defense uh, in the proper way. Okay. So that is the, the key part. Okay, let me function. put all your answers together so far. So I asked a grand um, a question uh, whether the Grand Asian Games or other games like the University in Chengdu or the Winter 
uh, Winter Games in Beijing last year can translate into a rising sports industry? And your answer is, is not directly, but through many elements adding together, like Mr. Dong mentioned, um, rising income of people and some spare time from the public. Um, uh, Mark uh, also mentioned uh, the, the uh, events are very important to stimulate the sports economy. And Mr. mentioned the stardom of some super talented athletes and also investment and also education. So Mr. Dong, do you think if you put these two, uh, these five elements together, the market will be ready to start flying? Yes, it did. As we, uh, as we are just entering the first half, not even the half point of the Asian Games, what we can talk about, maybe a little bit of the uh, micro perspectives, some particular details. But if you look at the big picture, if I use the word big picture, I think, yeah, overall, you see what China is doing. China seems to be knowing what it's doing. You know, it's a, a little bit crowded maybe from uh, from Chengdu to Hangzhou because of the delay, one by two years and the other by one year okay. uh, from the original plan, uh, the, the, the plan because of schedule because of uh, COVID. But now if we can overcome such difficulties and challenges, I think we are on a long-term strategy of like Mark put it, that you know, the United States is already, the so sports economy is already contributing three to uh, two to three percent and China's strategy is by 2035, it can reach 4%, as, oh. as much as 4% of the entire GDP. And that's a, a very ambitious target, but that's probably the only way to go, uh, given the fast development of AI and technological advancement, infringing on or invading human labor in the economy. I think it, this absolutely speeds up China's agenda of pushing more people to the real world development of uh, culture and sports, absolutely. And if you look at you know uh, NBA, H the, the NHL, and all the other American uh, sports businesses, industries, and China is far from reaching that point yet. And you know, outside of the Asian Games or national games, and all the professional sports leagues are very, very basically developed, not very Football. far from yeah. Yeah, Football, you know, mature. Soccer, you volleyball. Know. Yes, yeah. and that means huge business potential. Okay. And although we can debate about all the details and all the paths that we will take, but overall, yeah. as long as China doesn't reject that model of r allowing those businesses, sports-related economy to develop into four or even five percent of the entire gdp and then you know we we have the confidence okay based on the mid to far uh, perspective miss mm. hong do you think um have you recently observed the rise in sports industry investors to invest more in the sports industry in china Actually, <clears throat> actually, in theory, I, I didn't uh, say that way, but uh, we always, uh, you know, from my opinion, from my peer, that I can say, you know, I have been teaching more than 20 years, you know, this is sport management and the economy, and uh, from the parents of the students, at the beginning, 20 years ago, they think, what's that? Well, they don't even heard sports about that. Sports management. Yeah, sport management. But uh, now, a lot of parents, they, are, they agree with their children's choice, so more and more students, they start interesting about that one. So that uh, I think we can see this is another way we can see the sport industry is growth in China. Okay, yeah, from the education way, yeah. more young talents. Yeah. Yes. What about Mark? Do you think uh, the Chinese uh, uh, sports industry is worthy your more attention from global investors? You know, it's definitely I, I think open to investment. I I, I personally see uh, during the pandemic. A, a slowing down of investment, particularly from the private sector. I think it's only natural a lot of those folks in that sector uh, found it very hard to sort of uh, survive that period economically with, you know, virtually no activity in the sports sector going on for a number of years. 
So I, I do think there's a responsibility for government to be the lead to drive this back to re, uh, re-establish those major sports events uh, and also then stimulate the private sector because ultimately I, I believe the government and private sector working in tandem I think is a, a positive and the best way forward. Um, I think the government you know, uh, creates the backdrop, the, uh, the, 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 the legitimacy, uh, you know, back in and structure to, to, to put these events in place and often supply, supply the underwriting and financing of the events and in, in infrastructure themselves. The private sector is also really important to uh, bring creativity, bring in sponsorship partners, uh, and ultimately sort of really sort of drive the industry beyond uh, the traditional government sector, which is really important. So there's definitely opportunity. Uh, investment needs to be kickstart again, and I think some of that is also linked with other uh, uh, financial issues in the market at the moment, with, with regard sort of uh, borrowing prices, interest rates, etc. That has also slowed down. So I think there is a responsibility to, to, to re-stimulate that, and I do I do see that happening. You know, whether it be with the Asian Games or some of the other events that we talked about a re-establishment and re-stimulus of the economy there, which I think will then uh, help the whole ecosystem going forward. Great. Good to know that. Miso, uh, we've always talked about China's rising middle class, people's rising spending power, rising interest in spending in sports activities. We do see a lot of uh, people around me, you know, spend more time and money in body, you know, in working out, bodybuilding and running and everything ski everything does your company technical group maintain its interest and confidence in the chinese sports market does your company have more plan in engaging more maybe arranging activities or marketing campaigns or bring more products to china or more investment we saw i think he's gone yeah Mark, what about you? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, uh, there's great opportunity uh, to bring uh, more of that to China. Um, I think there's some particular sectors of China that offered very real opportunity where China is taking the lead. Um, and, and I think those are the real exciting investment opportunities. We've mentioned esports as a particular platform yep. that may be of interest, really showing strong get growth in China. I mentioned the fact that China is showing a lead in uh, sectors like uh, the digital activity around sports, uh, virtual uh, sports, uh, AI, all those sort of things, China is taking the lead. So that tech side of thing, I think is a real opportunity for investors to not only see opportunity, Mm. but also extract that opportunity and see how it can be used in other parts of the world. uh, I also think there are, uh, you know, sectors around, uh, you know, mobile use, and I mentioned social commerce that really China are a lead at. And again, if they're a lead here, how can that business then be one nurtured in China, but also be taken as a global opportunity? And it's those sort of really unique areas that China holds a lead in that I would particularly sort of focus uh, as an investment opportunity. Right. Uh, Mr. Tung, it's uh, worth, yeah. Okay. Mr. you're back. You know, my question yeah, to you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Was, sorry about that. Yeah. Your company has been investing in China for many years because of seeing your products on the market for many years. I've tried out some uh, myself. Does your company, Technical Group, uh, maintain its confidence in, in continuing its investing in China, maybe conducting some marketing campaigns or enlarging your investment? Uh, what's the overall sentiment of the company towards the Chinese market? The overall uh, feeling, and uh, it's definitely positive. So otherwise, as I say, we should be, we cannot, let's say, step out because of the COVID. We invested since a long time. So in this moment, uh, we are uh, 
I say I would like to say that the the tougher part uh, and tougher moment is already gone, uh, and this is what we hope. Uh, so, <laughs> therefore, uh, we are uh, in a new phases, and uh, we are. Uh, doing a new planning in terms of marketing investment and relaunch uh, our uh, our brands of course uh, and give us the maximum support uh, to the to the whole industry uh, for sure uh, it's uh, this the actual situation uh, of the economy doesn't help in uh, the uh, the stimulation and the growing uh, in the back of the to the normal number and this is we know but that is not the reason uh, why we need to uh, to be negative or uh, pessimistic um, we are all the industry. When I, I travel in a lot during the summer to speaking with the different uh, stakeholder, and uh, the um, there is a uh, enthusiasm uh, of it. It's tough to tr to turn in the enthusiasm in, in figures, uh, but definitely it's uh, it's a momentum where uh, we need to invest probably more, and we need to put in our effort in the in the best way uh, to relaunch uh, the. This is our industry, and uh, for sure to have a benefit for uh, for our brands and our company, because after twenty years uh, that we are uh, uh, in China, it's uh, we thinking internally at the quarter if it was a reason or not uh, to stay, and we say yes, uh, yeah, we we have to, we have to. You have to. Because okay, Mister. So China. In the how are you prepared <laughs> for the upcoming ski season, which is maybe probably just a few weeks away? As I told you before, I mean, we're talking a lot with the other stakeholders, especially with the ski resorts, because we need to make it and we need to be prepared and to host in the customer in the best way that is possible. I'd like to say that probably the biggest challenge for the for our industry now is to have a retention of the customer that they uh, appear in on the market. And the second, I'd like to say that the reopen of the of the board means uh, people that they can back to fly uh, out of China, and uh, we need to keep it the customers in China because the competition now it's not only internally, but it's even uh, from other uh, countries like Japan and South Korea, but as well as uh, Europe and, uh, and North America. So I've, this is the part that we are uh, working in order to even organize events uh, for youth, uh, for uh, kids, uh, for uh, uh, young people, in order to make in the winter sports uh, exciting and. Uh, and an interesting playground uh, in uh, in China without uh, giving them the chance uh, to migrate uh, to other countries. <laughs> that is probably the biggest challenge that we are uh, on place. Okay. And with the GAS, so the government uh, uh, of, uh, of sport, uh, we are even uh, signing an MU uh, couple of one year ago with the European community in order to promote in the sports uh, in um, different provinces uh, with, uh, <clears throat> towards uh, the developing of the not only the winter sports but all the Olympic uh, sports. You know, it's very complicated, more complicated than I thought industry, <laughs> sports industry, yes, uh, it's a lot of work to do. And it's even, it's, it still have a, an exciting role as well, don't worry, not only a big challenge, it's even stimulated and a big... Uh, yeah, also very excited. Enthusiasm on it, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mark just mentioned uh, the eSports, Mr. Dong. Um, we know that eSports is newly added into the official competition in this year's Asian Games in Hangzhou. Uh, there are some uh, number of other uh, games like uh, uh, breaking, you know, those boys dancing on the hard ground, kabaddi, dragon boating. I think these reflect the changing trends of uh, Asian sports culture and also people, especially young people's interests. Tell us your understanding about these new games. Well, these sports or games uh, have, each of them has their own story of development. Uh, like eSports, I think uh, it took some, uh, well, some, some nerve wracking uh, waiting for, for China to give it a final nod to eSports or eGaming because, because uh, sometimes control you know, the yeah. government or the authorities have uh, some concerns about what that would mean to the mental and physical health of the younger generation. Yeah. And over the last decade, there has been debate about it. But finally, it's uh, given a go ahead. And, uh, and don't forget that, uh, you know, e-games, the, the business behind it, behind e-games and e-sports uh, are dominated by Chinese companies. And also the users of, of such gadgets and also the games are also largely Asian, and of course, uh, without excluding Europeans and Americans, but largely Asian, China, Korea, 
And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's so important for the business. And uh, it's already so popularly embraced by the younger generation. And you simply say no to it, it wouldn't be very practical or realistic. So we will see what would be uh, happening to, to the games. And it will absolutely involve, uh, influence uh, the potential fairing of uh, certain giant companies yeah. uh, in China, which owns uh, both of the two major games uh, most popular in the world. Yeah. And Kabaddi have been around for a while. Yeah. And, uh, and, and also, yeah, I, as I mentioned, Rugby, uh, Rugby 7 and Rugby Union will be watching it. And also uh, cricket, which is, you know, outside of the, of the Olympic Games, cricket is one of the most money-making sports in oh. the world. They don't, they don't worry too much about joining the Olympic Games. No. They, they know how to make money uh, among their own territories, but they, they would be very happy to see that cricket would take root here. Uh, to in China, yes, yes, which is already very popular in South Asia, like India, uh, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan. But why not in China? Because uh, all those sports would have tremendous opportunities. The, I think China is open to all new sports because the, 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 the landscape here in China in professional sports is very, very different, if not opposite to that in the, in the United States. When you want to introduce a new sport, professional or a commercial sports, into the U.S. market, you need to gain some kind of tolerance from those major players. But here in China, no major players is dominating the market. And uh, 1.4 billion people, and, uh, and they don't have any major affection or preference for any major sport yet because it's very easy for families and even the players themselves to feel the juan, which is highly competitive, but very little opportunities or probability for you to make a success inside soccer or basketball. And then they naturally are open to new sports, maybe cricket, maybe rugby and e-sports. Maybe e-sports, yeah. Yes, I, I think, yeah, that's, that's why uh, those interest groups would look at the Asian games and see what they can expect after the games would mean to this vast land, which, are, which is so open to new ideas because uh, so many kids are already locked and restricted yeah. in certain sports and kind of be struggling to get out of it. So the more the better, the more choices, yeah. Right, uh, Miss Lee, let's talk about, talk about the legacy because earlier we talked about investments in the sports industry. Uh, Guangzhou yeah. for this event um, invested in 56 venues, but only 12 of them are newly built. Others are renovated or temporarily built. I think it's environmentally friendly, but at the same time, it leaves a big legacy for the city. You just mentioned the, the huge benefit the city might get after the games. How do you think this would boost the city's uh, sports industry with so many sports facilities being available. Yeah, you know, when we talk about it, we, we, we can get the benefit from the uh, infrastructure of, for the, for the sport the event organizer. But on the other side, you know, the, uh, the venues was uh, constructed or renovated for the games, continue burden host the city and the uh, uh, stage uh, even long time after games, you know, unless this venue can be used effectively. Yeah. You know, especially like the Olympic uh, uh, center, the capability 70,000 seat, it is uh, partially luckily becomes the white elegant, uh, uh, elephant. And the, you know, the one way is the we can make more money. It is, you know, the venues uh, name rights. Maybe it is better. We, we can consider the sale the sale name right. Another way is the reinvestment of the venues. You know, like the Beijing 2008 Olympic Games leaves a legacy, like Bird Nest and the Water Cube, the, which beca becomes the tourist tourist attraction. Yeah, landmark. The, yeah, also landmark. Also, this still venue generated today. So I think this is a better way. Also, the, you know, the Bird Nest. In the winter time, they become the snow theme park. Yeah. They can become make them more profit for the kids. That's great. Mm. Uh, very good uh, examples of sustainable development. Yeah.
And now let's talk about the technologies because uh, uh, one technology we mentioned is the technology transformation of watching the games. We used to watch games um, on TV solely, but now we also watch it on internet. Um, multiple live stream platforms, small short videos. Mark, do you think uh, people in the sports industry need to pay attention more to the internet, to live streaming, to whatever young people are paying attention to those platforms for better marketing, for, for mark better advertising, for mark better advertising campaigns? Uh, I think the simple answer to that is yes. Um, I think, you know, if we take ourselves back traditionally, when we used to watch major events or sports, we all used to do it around the television. Uh, these days, we have much more choice of sports and activities. We also have, you know, competition for other leisure and entertainment activities that, in, in honesty, compete with sport. Uh, and what we find is that the market is segmenting in terms of what, you know, different uh, territories, what different genders, what different ages uh, want and how they consume uh, sports content. Um, an old guy like me tends to still sit around the TV, but uh, if I look at my sons, they consume sport all on social media, all short form content. And it's really understanding that if you're involved in sports as a rights holder, putting on events or a host, uh, or you're a brand who is sponsoring sport, you have to know the, uh, the makeup of that uh, demographic market and then make sure that you are delivering what each segment needs to be delivered or what, what requires to be delivered. And one of the interesting things that we've seen uh, over the last you know, decade or two is the emergence of how important data is in that question. Mm. So understanding the data uh, of not only your consumer but also uh, as a sports manager what is happening so you can make better decisions we've got to a much more nuanced understanding of what we are doing as a business um, and when it comes to you know attracting fans and young people that data if we can collate enough of it gives us very clear information to what people like and when we find out what people like, we then can deliver that to them in the best boat nature that fulfills their, their market demand. And I think that's really, really important. So I'm, I'm a massive, massive fan of what technology, what data uh, is going to give to the sports business going forward. And I, I honestly believe that will ultimately give us all individually a far greater experience and enjoyment in sport, which will hopefully stimulate that economy even further. Okay, Mark, I want to ask you this question. We, we didn't prepare this question, but I wanted to ask this you, to you. How come the, the British Premier League became so successful out of so many competitions in the world, attracting so much attention, becomes such a uh, huge success, uh, maybe taking a significant uh, amount of the UK's economy? Uh, can the success be replicated? Short answer, please. Britain has two major global success stories in the world of sports. One is the English Premier League and one is Formula One. Both became successful because they got together as a collective group and sold their media rights globally. And both of those have gained hegemony in their sport by being the leader in their global media rights sport. Because effectively, sport over the last three, four decades, its growth has been mainly achieved by their growth in revenue from media rights. And quite simply, that is where the EPL and Formula One grew. I think the future will offer more challenges in terms of how revenue streams and opportunities develop. But in short, that's how they got to that position. What about uh, you, um, uh, Miso? Because I want to also ask you about Italy's experience in developing its sports industry. We know Italy is very advanced in many uh, sports sectors. I heard about, uh, if I'm right, uh, fencing, uh, also very much uh, successful in football. Tell us about the success of uh, the Italian foot, uh, sports industry and how can it be replicated somewhere else? 
the I would like to divide the answer in in two parts because what Mark just said. Uh, I mean, uh, how important is the IT and to de or uh, develop the media in order to develop in some sports? Because if you're thinking about football, of course, they have a, a lot of uh, fans, but they have even a lot of players. Formula One, in reality, is just fans. Uh, so it's two different targets from my perspective. So uh, we need to divide the what has been successful for the media. And uh, definitely, uh, Formula One is very popular in, uh, in Italy as well. Soccer probably in proportion between uh, the number of uh, people uh, that they are a sit sports player compared to active sport player is still be in a huge uh, and big difference. Uh, the other sports uh, that they maybe are minority sport for the media, but they are quite interesting, as you said, uh, fencing or even uh, alpine ski, basketball, volleyball, volleyball, that they don't really reach it in a or tennis. Is, tennis is a yes and no, but they don't reach in a big uh, interest in terms of media. They remain in a, a kind of a, a Olympic sport, so there are not a big uh, uh, amount of money behind. Uh, yeah. And that is going to be keeping uh, in, uh, the minority. So there are more players than, than uh, watcher, And uh, and that is probably the, making uh, the difference. One of the parts in Italy that we have uh, is a very good uh, school of sports. And uh, and this is very important. Uh, and then uh, the other part is the education, and to involve the sports uh, at the primary uh, school level, because is uh, this is is an education program that you need to build up. Uh, and uh, uh, since when the uh, with the kids and the young generation, because that one is going to be in uh, in in Latin you say men sana and corpore sana means that uh, you can have an healthy mind in a healthy body. So the two parts they could be helping them. And, uh, and this one, uh, if you're thinking that the Olympics is coming from the women's in uh, Athens uh, uh, many thousand years ago, that is, uh, is important to show how the sports are not only money side, uh, but even uh, healthy and social uh, responsibilities. Because when you have a health uh, population, you can even reduce in certain kind of social cost. So it's a, it's a complex, uh, it's a complex uh, part. I'd like to say in Italy, we have more uh, players than uh, in minority sports uh, because people, they like to spend uh, outdoor uh, time. Uh, and I have to say that the landscape of Italy is helping because we have a mountain, we have a sea, we have a hill. So there are even different aspects uh, that it could be effective, the, the results uh, uh, of uh, the sport uh, practicants uh, in, each single, uh, in each single country. And I think that in China, we are in this kind of phase in which the sport is entering more and more in the school programs. And uh, I don't remember, I think that it was Mrs. Young before, that they say that we have more interest in among the kids and the parents that they play their own sports. I remember when I came in 2005, a lot of parents, they would not, they will, they want to be delivering the kids to play kind of dangerous sports and ski was one of that one. Now instead, uh, they are very interesting. So it's an interesting trend and evolution before it was just a swimming and, uh, and running uh, and that's it. Yeah, I, I saw uh, Mr. Dong uh, smiling uh, to what Miso was saying. Uh, so they were talking about two different things actually. Uh, England, uh, Premier League football is very mainstream, uh, dominating the media exposure worldwide. but. Miso said Italy, a lot of Italian people are playing minority uh, games. They just play their own game, perform for sports, for experience, because they are taking advantage of their landscape, the mountain, the sea, or some maybe uh, historical or cultural heritage. What do you think China should do? Mainstream or minority? Well, you know, given China's size, economic size, and the size of the population, there is not a real comparison between China with either of those countries. And culture. And maybe it yeah. makes more sense to compare China with the United States, potentially, maybe in another 10 or 20 years, uh, or maybe potentially with India, if India really can take off in terms of uh, sports development because of the size of the population and also the economy and its diversity among people from one province to another, from one group age to another. So China's uh, you know, situation is so different from those. But when it 
comes back to your very question, you know, my own interpretation, you know, maybe a little different, but Mark must be familiar with this answer that people attribute it because there are four major soccer uh, leagues in Europe, but, uh, you know, it's so overwhelmingly successful and popular uh, around the world as uh, the Premier League uh, in England, but I think many other people in competing perspectives, they think English plays such an important role. It helps communicate. Yeah. It helps communicate all the reports, the statistics, timely to the rest of the world in that very language. Mm. And that already defeats, you know, the other languages. So culture in, in Germany, Italy, in and Spain, yeah. yes. Yeah. And that's but don't forget when it comes to, you know, China, the Chinese fans in uh, of soccer, the biggest ever import or the icon or ambassador for the Italian football is Marcello Lippi, mm -hmm. uh, who played overwhelmingly larger role than any other British American sportsman or, you know, any person personality from other sports, simply because of Lippi played such an important role in Chinese soccer, uh, despite the eventual result. Oh, he was a coach, right? Yeah, he was the head coach of the For Chinese the national team. team. National team, yeah. yes. Okay, what about you, Miss Lee? Um, they talk about the mainstream sports, minority sports. When you're teaching sports management, are your young students interested in mainstream or minority? I think uh, from my perspective, from my students, sometimes when I ask my students, uh, what do you really like? Uh, do you really participate, uh, and participate in sport? You know, it's interesting answer is uh, most of them, they just enjoy and watch watch different games or play the games or the they they involve the sports in a different way not like our generation maybe we're just running for them they are in a different way it's a very interesting one another one i think is that if we really want to develop the sport industry in china it really takes a long time because sometimes the culture is really plays very important roles you know it takes a long time uh, let, let people to accept the support is what that means really for us. Okay. You know, because people believe, believe a different way for the healthy, maybe they think this is a... It's really personal uh, choice. Yeah, yeah, it's really personal. Also, I think really we have that long history. If we want to change, uh, this takes a long time. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Young people have many distinctive uh, yeah. choices for themselves. My final question, um, ladies and gentlemen, would be the sustainability, the green development of sports. We saw that on the uh, Hangzhou uh, Asian Games opening ceremony, there are a lot of gestures about sustainability, about grain development. They even have uh, digital fireworks at the opening ceremony and to try to achieve this zero carbon emission of the games, uh, the, the, the torch relay and everything uh, to keep with the, the games environmental friendly commitments. I mean, this has become a very general a very persistent idea of all these uh, international events, sports events, from Beijing Olympic Games, uh, Winter Olympic Games, to the University Aid, to Asian Games, and uh, very much so, I think, in the Paris Olympic Games, uh, in the coming summer, and also in the Italian uh, Cortina Winter Olympic Games uh, a few years uh, from now on. So let's briefly talk about this application of environmental awareness in uh, games, uh, for example, in Asia games. Start with you, for, uh, Mark. Yeah, so it's very interesting. I think, you know, stuff like the no fireworks in Hangzhou and obviously the, the policy around uh, promoting, you know, uh, as much low carbon activity in the games is a really positive thing. But I think from my point of view, that is only a very, very small part of what the uh, sustainability issues are around major events uh, and the two major in, impact uh, attributes from events are coming from logistics and bi building infrastructure mm. so when we talk about environmental uh, sustainability major sports events are almost in conflict with the idea about 
living sustainable living. Uh, you tend to build new venues, you tend to have people traveling and equipment traveling around the world. So as soon as you walk out your door, you create an impact. As soon as you put a brick on top of another brick, you create impact. So I, I think events and the whole model of international events going forward has to look very carefully at the way they do. And I think, you know, the IOC and other sort of rights holders are now sort of coming to you know this question what is our future do we have to go to new countries and new events all the time can we use far more existing facility can we reduce our impact on logistics do so many people have to go all those sort of things our, th our industry are grappling with uh, and i think we have to look at it very seriously in terms of what is going to be the new strategy for the future uh, because I don't think any true major sports event can be sustainable the way we're running them now. And we have to sort of really be very innovative about how we go about it. So I'll just give one example of, of the cup. You know, virtual sports. Um, I was down in Singapore for the, uh, the eSports Olympics event uh, recently. And the, the opportunity, not just for what we call eSports gaming, but what I call virtual connected sports, where you're actually doing physical activity, yeah. but you're connected virtually. So there's an app called Swift, for example, where you can ride on a bike and race in a virtual uh, hierarchy against someone on the other side of the world. And those sort of activities may cut down travel, but also have the opportunity to increase understanding and also sort of a global sort of network of people in sport. So, I mean, that's just one idea, but I think we have to use this technology to truly disrupt what we're, we're currently doing in major events and find a, a way forward that can be, you know, environmentally sustainable, but also, you know, have a economic uh, sustainability attached to it as well. Very deep insights, Mark. And uh, what about MISO? Because we know uh, Cortina is going to host the uh, next Winter Olympic Games, the ski industry is very interesting. On the first hand, it's somewhat impacting the environment, you know, with the uh, people activity on the mountains, on the snow. On the other hand, it's also very fragile to extreme weather conditions, you know, the, the, the slow line gradually, you know, rising up and making it, you know, propelling or pushing the uh, event organizers or ski uh, resort operators to make more man-made snows to cover uh, the, those uh, ski areas. What do you think of these uh, paradox? Andy, you touch on a good point and I would like to even bridge in what Marco just said. Uh, uh, the Milano Cortina Olympics are uh, they using probably 70-80% of existing infrastructure and that is definitely as called one of the greenest uh, Olympic Games uh, event. On the other way around, uh, there is the logistic uh, that it's very a big problem because uh, uh, especially for the winter sports uh, <clears throat> Olympics, uh, they are play in not very friendly environment because we're talking about mountains most of the time uh, the uh, logistic is not easy because the, the road are limited uh, and uh, you need to move in from one venue to another one. And I know that from the Olympics uh, in Cortina, they are talking about uh, how to uh, move in athletes from one venue to another one uh, because uh, there should be even natural uh, effect uh, that it could be affecting the transportation because if it's no win and we're talking about a pass through peak or high mountain, the transportation is going to be a, is going to be a limit. So uh, the in terms of, uh, as you say, mach let's say industry to supporting the developing of ice and snow, because these are the two main, I think that the industry has already reached a, a high level of uh, uh, low impact uh, in terms of uh, especially carbon uh, CO2. This is definitely, it's, uh, it's already a good, uh, good uh, result. The other part, uh, it's uh, the, to be economic sustainable because uh, a lot of time you're starting with a budget and then you're going to be over a certain uh, yeah. 
uh, amount and sometimes it's very big amount and sometimes this kind of um, impact from the economical point of view is not really counted because we are mainly focused on green eh? yeah. and not from the impact in general so i think in a this is another impact, um, aspect, uh, important aspect that is, has to be taken in, into into consideration. I'm quite confident that uh, the, and I hope that in the future, uh, the most of the biggest events that are going to be uh, considered uh, facilities already existing, and uh, the other part is how to reconvert it, uh, to uh, these facilities uh, to the public uh, activities uh, after the game uh, are over because this is the other important part, especially for the winter. There are some uh, cathedral in the desert, or has been mentioned like elephant, uh, uh, of facilities that never been used in anymore, like a uh, ski jump uh, or uh, uh, bobsledding, uh, this part of uh, sports, probably even the Olympic Committee probably need to reconvert uh, which are the sports uh, that are attracting people and uh, leaving a little bit the tradition behind and look at forward what is the trend of sports and to be even in this way thinking which could be the facilities that have the less impact in uh, in the future and uh, e-sport uh, in singapore olympic e-sport is, is a trend probably <laughs> as well yeah play the sports virtually uh, or uh, in uh, distance not all but yeah. some some part and uh, the evolution of the sports the olympic games that they um, and they are the trendsetter in somehow they always have a kind of experimental sports uh, to see which is the return of uh, the audience and the impact in terms of uh, um, environment and to change in uh, this kind of uh, this kind of trend because uh, we need to evolve we need to evolve the sports according to the evolving of the uh, of the society and the community and the consumer needs thank you so much for your insights and uh, we'd love this discussion to be a bit longer because uh, these topics are far more complex than we thought and there are so many different opinions on this but the Hangzhou Asian Games uh, brought us to discussion. That's very good. Now, the Hangzhou Asian Games not only serve as an event for showcasing unity and friendship among Asian nations, it also represents the future of sports industry, of innovation, technology, creativity, and sustainability. The Asian Games will help Chinese sports industry evolve and upgrade. We'd like to thank again to our guest in the studio, um, Liu Yong Hong. Associate Professor at School of Sports Economics and Management of Central University of Finance and Economics, and Mr. Paul Dong, co-founder of ER Asia. And also online, we would like to thank our online guest, Mark Thomas, Managing Director of S2M Consulting, and Remedio Brunetti Missile, our old friend. He's Managing Director of Technica Group China. With that, we come to this end of uh, this talk. Thanks for watching. I'm Jun Jun Fun. See you next time.